Last week, we had the fast-paced introduction to the gospel, that is the book of Mark. It's so exciting. Jesus has been baptized. He's been tempted in the desert, and then he's healed Peter's mother-in-law. He's healed a leopard. He's teaching. He's healing lots of people. Mark has set it up to say, here is Jesus. Isn't he great? But to anybody reading the gospel of Mark, whether that's us or the people who were the initial audience for Mark, the first people to read it, we all know the end of the story is that some people were so cross with Jesus that they killed him. So Mark needs to ask this question, when Jesus is so great, why did some people get so upset with him? And that's what he's starting to do in chapter two. And one of the ways that Mark is doing that in chapter two, he's answering that question by showing the questions people were asking about Jesus. Questions like, why did you say his sins were forgiven instead of just healing him? Or why do you hang out with sinners? Or why aren't you fasting? Or why are you picking ears of corn on the Sabbath? Or why are you healing people on the Sabbath? These questions and the stories in the chapters to come tell us why the very religious people didn't like Jesus. They thought Jesus was blasphemous, that he was disrespecting God. They thought if he was a good Israelite leader, a good rabbi, he would only hang out with good people. And if he was a good leader, he would follow all the rules. And he didn't. And that's what Mark is starting to show us in chapter 2. First, we have this fantastic story of the paralyzed man with the four friends who lowered him through the roof. So imagine, it might be quite hard for us to imagine now, but imagine you're in a crowded house. All your friends are there. All your family is there. All the neighbors keep coming because you've heard about Jesus, how he says these wonderful things and he heals people and everybody wants to see him. So they keep coming in, coming in. It's actually it gets so uncomfortably crowded that you can't even move elbows or jostle around or anything. And then while you're listening to Jesus, suddenly you feel some dust on your head and you look up and there's some guys up on the roof digging through the roof. Now, it probably wasn't like a sledgehammer. It wasn't a roof like ours. It might have been a thatched roof, maybe leaves or branches, and they're cutting through it. And then they're, they're cutting a hole, and then they lower their friend down, and it's really exciting. And actually, remember, it's so crowded that the man probably didn't go to the floor. He probably like, landed in people's arms who were there listening to Jesus. And you're it's so excited because you know this guy, and you're thinking that Jesus is going to heal him. This is going to be great. And then Jesus looks at the man, and he says so tenderly, Son, your sins are forgiven. Wow. Can you imagine Jesus looking at you and saying that? For those of us who believe, it's going to be so great when we get to heaven and Jesus looks us straight in our face and says, your sins are forgiven. What could we want besides that? But some people, that annoyed them. They said to themselves, why does this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. No one can forgive sins but God alone. And see, they've got the right information, but the wrong conclusion. They're right. No one can forgive sins but God alone, so Jesus must be God. Now, by the way, they don't say that out loud, who can forgive sins by God alone. They just think it, and Jesus knows, which is just like when it says in Psalm 139 that God perceives our thoughts from afar. But instead of, of putting two and two together and saying, no one can forgive sins, Jesus must be God, they make a, the wrong conclusion that he must be blaspheming and disrespecting God. Because some people just refuse to believe what is obvious. Instead of feeling the excitement and the wonder and the relief that Jesus can heal bodies and our sin-sick souls, they were just annoyed. So Jesus left that crowded place, and next he went for a walk by the lake. More fresh air, more space for people to come and hear him. And as he was going, he passed Levi, the tax collector. Now, tax collectors were employed by Rome, by the oppressive government, to take money from the Israelites. And so they, and they would often pocket some of that money for themselves, so they weren't liked very much. And Capernaum, where they were, it was a trade route, which meant that the Romans wanted to charge people to go in and out. But there was no charge for that trade route before the Romans. So the Israelites were now having to pay to go where before they could go for free. 
It would be like if somebody set up a toll booth at the end of your road, and before you wanted to go anywhere, in or out, you had to pay somebody. You could see how you would dislike the person asking for that money. So being a, a toll collector, a tax collector, it wasn't in itself a sin, although taking extra for yourself was sinful, and it was choosing money over the love and compassion for your neighbors. But mostly people just didn't like them, so they were shunned, they were outsiders. And then they, of course, would go and hang out with other outsiders, people who were considered sinners, those on the fringe of society. Jesus said to Levi, follow me. And Levi just does it. He just jumps up, he leaves that job behind and follows Jesus. It's wonderful, isn't it? A lot of people take a lot longer to decide to follow Jesus and to do it. And then Levi has a dinner party and he invites his other friends who are sinners, who are the outsiders of society, because he knows that Jesus has something to say to them and it says that lots of them follow Jesus. So they're having this dinner party together and somebody else, one of the religious leaders, sees them and they snitched. And not only snitched, they started doing some kind of juvenile name calling saying, Jesus is hanging out with those sinners. Now why, why does that matter who Jesus hangs out with? Jesus was teaching, he was a leader, he was a rabbi, and other people were following him. And the other religious leaders, they thought that sin was contagious. That Jesus would be unclean by being around unclean people. But Jesus knew his forgiveness was what was contagious. He wasn't made unclean by them, they were made clean by him. He touched what was sick and dirty and broken, and he made it clean and whole and forgiven, not the other way around. He said, it's not the healthy that need the doctor, but the sick. That seems obvious, doesn't it? It's the sick people that need a doctor to help them. And they knew that people were bringing him the sick people and he was healing them. But in case you didn't catch it in the story about the man coming through the roof, Jesus is saying, the problem isn't just sickness, it's sin. He goes on to say, I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, just to be clear, Jesus isn't connecting illness with sin. He's not saying that people are sick and suffering because the sufferer is a sinner. I think people still think that sometimes. I think there's a morality that's attached to sickness that isn't true and isn't fair. And Jesus isn't saying that. He's saying, yes, I will heal your bodies because I know that you need that, but you need more than healing in your body. You need healing in your soul. He's saying the paralyzed man, the feverish woman, the leper, they need healing and tax collectors need forgiving. And by the way, people who are judging and sneering and pointing at fingers, you also need forgiving. Because in this story, there's two kinds of unrighteousness. There's truthful unrighteousness, the people who knew they were sinners, and then there's this bogus righteousness, fake righteousness, that is actually sin in itself too. And Jesus has come for both kinds of people, to forgive all of them and all of us. The next section is about following rules. Now, when we lived in Dublin, our car, the speedometer was in kilometers because that's what they use in the Republic of Ireland. But sometimes we would have to drive to Northern Ireland to go to a Salvation Army event or to headquarters. And of course, in Northern Ireland, like the rest of the UK, the speed limits were in miles. And I couldn't do the math in my head of what 70 miles per hour was in kilometers. Now I know because I Googled it, it's 112 kilometers per hour, but I couldn't do that at the time. So I just had to kind of follow along with the rest of the cars on the road and hope that they were following the speed limit and not going too fast because I didn't really know what the rule was. Now rules were really important to the Israelites. They had some rules from the Old Testament and then they added more to them. Rules kept them safe and rules helped solve disagreements between them, but maybe most importantly, the rules showed them who belonged to their community. It set them apart from the other nations around them. And if Jesus was gonna be a leader in this community, they wanted him to follow the rules. And the people who were like important and in charge, sometimes people get to be in charge because they're the people who follow all the rules the best. 
And so they wanted Jesus to follow the rules. And if he wasn't doing it, then he was kind of a threat to their authority, their position, because he was saying, in order to be important, you don't have to be able to tick all the boxes and follow the rules. And that made them feel unmoored and unsafe and cross. If Jesus could convince people to break rules like you're not allowed to pick ears of corn during the Sabbath, what was he going to do next? Now, if you look on into chapter three, when Jesus heals the man who comes into the synagogue, Jesus is teaching and the man comes in and people are angry because he's there and he wants to be healed. And Jesus, he's angry at them. He's disturbed by their hearts, it says. Now, and it says in James, don't be in your anger, do not sin. But I think we should be like Jesus and only angry at sin. And by the way, he doesn't do anything. He doesn't do any work to heal the man. He just says, stretch out your hand. And Jesus was talking anyway. So I'm not sure why they were so mad that he was healing on the Sabbath. It wasn't that he was working. See, this was really important to them on the Sabbath, that they didn't work. And it wasn't just a matter of like, oh, we might talk today about self-care and resting. The Sabbath was an act of resistance. See, if you're a slave in Egypt or in Babylon or the Roman oppressors all around you, the oppressor, the slave driver, does not want you to stop one day a week and rest and worship. He wants you to keep working. So when the Israelites took a Sabbath, they were saying, obeying God is still more important than obeying you. And we don't care if you're going to beat us or hurt us. We are still going to follow the rules that God sets. And that's important. That's something that we can take out of as well. It's important for us to take a day a week to just rest. I mean, Jesus said Sabbath was made for the man. It was made for us. We aren't made for the Sabbath. And you might not feel that checking an email or running the washing machine or doing your homework. You might not feel that those things are your oppressors if you do them on a Sabbath. I mean, maybe you do. But what we do by not doing those things on Sunday is saying the rest of the week our lives are dictated by all of these things. But this day, I'm not going to let them rule over me. I'm going to spend time worshiping God, enjoying my family, resting, doing the things that God has given me, not being oppressed by all the other things that I feel I have to do. And I think that's important. Now, at the end of the Sabbath, we should be able to say, how was this day for me? You might want to think about that tonight. If the Sabbath was for you, what good did it do you today? Now, sometimes that needs a little preparation ahead of time. You might do a better job of it next week because we have to prepare things beforehand, like maybe, for example, do your homework on Saturday instead of Sunday night in order for the Sabbath to be for you. But it wasn't just that they were resting. They were adding in lots of these extra, extra, extra rules on the Sabbath. And that was what Jesus was saying. It is important to rest. It is important to take time to focus on God. But the leaders were putting more rules on people. So instead of being oppressed by the work they had to do, they were being oppressed by the rules they had to follow. And that was what Jesus wanted to break people free from. So in all of this, we remember that Mark is telling us in the gospel, not just how Jesus is great, how he healed people, and it was spectacular, how he forgave them, and that was tender and beautiful. He's also showing us why people opposed Jesus, why it got so far that eventually they killed people. They were... They didn't like that Jesus was breaking rules. They didn't like that he was hanging out with sinners. They wanted to stop people from coming to Jesus. And it's a good question to ask us today. What stops us from coming to Jesus? What's the equivalent in your life of something that makes you paralyzed so you can't even move? What's the house that's so crowded that you feel like you can't even get in there because everybody else is there and you've been left out? What's a situation that is bad for you? Where are people who judge you and sneer at you and make you feel like you're nothing? Or what are the expectations that other people or probably your own self place on you that are too hard to follow? And these are things that take up space in our brain and keep us from coming to the Lord. And in Mark chapter two, 
he says, dig through the roof if you have to, get to Jesus. Get up and leave that situation that's bad for you. Sit with Jesus and listen to him. Get rid of the oppressive expectations that are in your life that are keeping you from just resting, enjoying the Lord. And you might need some friends to help you. And then, and then, you be the friend who brings the person who is paralyzed to Jesus. You might do this in your cell group. You might do this in your family, in your home, and in your extended family. You might need to invite some people around to hear about Jesus. Invite people to hear these sermons. Invite people to Zoom calls. Invite people to watch worship videos with you. Bring your friends to Jesus because he's got the healing. He has got the forgiving. He's got the love that each one of us needs. That's what's so exciting about Mark, about being a follower of Jesus, that we can come to him. And now we're going to go into this song, which, which we express in our hearts, Lord, I come to you. Let me be renewed. Again, forgive me. Again, heal me. Again, let me rest in your presence. I invite you to sing and reflect on this song, Lord, I come to you.
feel like if we were having worship today, this would be the point where I would be saying again, come forward for prayer if you need to. So I just want to say to you at home, come for prayer if you need to. You might wanna go back and play that song again. You might want to kneel wherever you are. You might want to lift up your hands. You might want to ask another person in your house to pray with you. But I just feel like you might need some more prayer. So shall we pray now? Oh Jesus, hold me close. Let that love surround me. I know, Jesus, that you're always loving me, but sometimes there's things in my life, sometimes there's things in our lives that keep us from you. God, we pray that you would help us to be healed. We pray for our bodies, that you would give us uh, resilience and courage, that you would help us be treated with medicine and doctors in ways that help our bodies. And we thank you for that, Lord. But most importantly, God, heal our sin. Forgive us and set us free. For those who are listening now, Lord, who know exactly, exactly the thing that they want to be forgiven. Oh, Lord, just look them in the face and let them know that they are forgiven. God, we thank you that you spend time with each one of us in our state of unrighteousness, of our needing you. We thank you for being with us. And we pray that you help us to spread your word of forgiveness to other people. And we pray, Lord, that you help us to keep our eyes focused on you, on the Sabbath and other days, so that the expectations we place on ourselves and others won't oppress us, but we will know freedom that is in you. And Lord, we just thank you again. We thank you again and again for the power of your love, your love that heals us, that forgives us, and that just keeps us going every day. So I pray for myself and I pray for our church and I pray for everyone watching this today that, that we would know the power of your love. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.